All right. Well, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of service, well, we've reached the end of um, our series on uh, my series on uh, on the attributes of God. So this is the uh, the series finale. I was actually I was actually just thinking just a, a few minutes ago. You know, you think of a, a, a finale of a series, at least as it relates to television. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll they'll extend the episode to an hour and a half or two hours. So I thought maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, if anything, this might be. Well, I say this, and it ends up not being the case. This might be a little bit shorter than than normal. We'll see, though. Um, we'll see. But um, yeah, so this last one we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the love of God. I forgot to to set out the bulletins. Oh well. There, you know what? They're I they're inside that pouch is what is what the is what the deal is, and uh, so if you want to take notes or whatever, sorry about, <laughs> sorry about that. Huh? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I guess the whole world goes awry when Jonathan's not here. So. <laughs> yeah, the love of God. Yeah. So. Um, so we've covered a wide range of, of, of attributes, and um, I think that, you know, I think I mentioned way back near the beginning of this series, uh, and specifically when I, when I talked about the wrath of God, the following attribute that I covered was, uh, if I remember correctly, the mercy of God. And I said, you know, you could, you could follow a message on the wrath of God with something like mercy or with love or his grace and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think I may have even mentioned a, a few messages ago when we talked about the grace of God that, you know, even that is one of the, uh, probably one of the favorites that people like to hear about. And I'd say that the, that the love of God is something that, uh, that would fall within that category as well, probably because um, it truly is an amazing love. And I, and I feel that that's somewhat of an understatement just to, just to say even that, but um, if we truly understand God's love for what it is, and at least maybe just skim the surface of it, we see that even what we're able to comprehend is amazing. And I say what we're able to comprehend because even if you look at places like Ephesians chapter three, it talks about the love of Christ, which is beyond comprehension. You know, um, that's how that's how great it is, and it's and it's unlike any other love that you might have, uh, that you might experience. Um, to a certain degree, I think that we can look at the love of God and compare it to the love that we're used to just among humans to a certain degree and to a certain level. And I think that the Bible kind of leaves room for that. For example, you know, when, when Jesus on his Sermon on the Mount is talking about, you know, if you, um, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts to those who ask him, you know? So there's a certain way where we identify with, with you know, the true heartfelt love as it relates to friendships, family relationships, and, and whatnot. But I think that that passage, I believe it's in Matthew 7, says something very important, is that we are evil, and that our love isn't always perfect, and that's not true for God. And so that's why Jesus can say, how much more, you know, uh, can, will, God give, will your heavenly Father give, give good gifts to those who ask him? Um, and so it's very important, I think, to, to recognize uh, that when we're talking about the love of God, there's, there's a large element of it that is unlike um, what we're used to and what we, and, you know, what we might experience. And even, and this is definitely true, and I don't think that I'll get any disagreement on this, it's um, even more so beyond comprehension of what our current world and society um, would, would say um, love is. I mean, you, you have all sorts of slogans that people use nowadays you know, love wins and that sort of thing. And, um, and I'm not too much of a fan of those slogans, you know, having to do with love that come from the world because I think the world's idea of love is, is flawed. That's not too surprising, but at the same time, if you look at how people define love, it's, it's really not, um, you know, it's really not what true love is. And, you know, you know, you, you think about that and then you compare it to the, the love of God. The love of God is so much of, of, of a, a, a big part of who he is, is that you have scripture saying in 1 John 4 that God is love, right? 
Um, and so that's and so we we see just from that that um, the love of God is is um, uh, is a big deal. Now that doesn't mean. I think it's important to establish this, and I think that I think that all of you probably get this. At least I'm going to assume um, that doesn't mean that when we're talking about God is love or that God is a loving God, that doesn't mean that God's love means that He's a totally permissive God, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's interesting. I was um, uh, over the past week or two. There's there's been kind of discussion within the Christian world about a certain pastor and in Texas who's, who's preached a sermon on LGBTQ plus, you know, sort of things. And he's, he's a pastor at, a, at this church that's, uh, uh, that is affirming of that. And his, his message um, to his congregation uh, was, was pro all of those, all of those things. Um, and I, I, there, was a, there was a program, I don't know if you've, uh, any of you have heard of uh, James White um, and uh, his program, The Dividing Line, um, but he had a, he's, but he had two programs combined, uh, probably combined three or four hours. You know, responding bit by bit to this to this uh, 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 to this sermon. But I mean, just even the sermon itself. I mean, if you were to listen to it straight through, um, is amazing. I mean, not not in a good way. Amazing in a in a totally bad way. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that caught my attention um, was the whole thing of how. God's love and the perception of God's love is used within that message as if to say God is is love and he's so much loving that he affirms who you are within that within that whole thing um you know so you can you can carry on at, in your in your homosexuality and and uh and rebellion um but that's okay because God is love and and, and, and whatnot. That's kind of a, a piece of what I caught from, it was kind of near the end of, of this, this man's sermon, but you hear something like that and you think that's a misunderstanding um, or, you know, of, of, of God's love or a lack of understanding altogether um, of God's love and what it is. So, you know, all that to say, again, going back to what I said a couple minutes ago, we say that God is love. That obviously doesn't mean that God is, is permissive. He says, oh, God is so loving that he'll just overlook sin um, and you can just you know live the way that you want to live and 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 that sort of thing that's not that's not the way that it that it that it works with with God um, and you know if, if for proof of that I mean just look at the cross we'll talk about that a little bit later but I mean um, but yeah so God is love but his love isn't isn't uh, isn't a permissive love and when we talk about the love of God um, as it relates to scripture uh, most of the time, what we're talking about with God's love is the agape love. Have you ever heard of agape? It's one of three common Greek terms uh, for love that's used in the Bible. And when we talk about agape, um, it's it's usually it's usually talking about the the love of the will, and it's a it's a it's a giving and a sacrificial sort of love. And it's not based on anything having to do with attraction or. Or, or whatnot, or, you know, it's, 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 again, it's just a love, it's a love of the will. And so I, one area of scripture that I want to bring to your attention is Deuteronomy chapter 7. I think this is, uh, this is interesting, and this is uh, words that are spoken um, to the community of Israel, and this is the second generation of Israelites before they, before they enter into the promised land. And in in chapter 7, and starting in verse 6, uh, verses 6 through 8 mainly, um, and this is what it says here. It says, For you are a, peop- a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So if you notice there, you know, it says, I mean, if you just kind of shorten that up a little bit, basically what it comes down to, it says it was not because you were more in number uh, than the others that the Lord set his love on you. And then if you skip down, 
in, uh, to the beginning of verse 8, but it was because the Lord loves you. You know, it, it, so it, the way that it's rolled out there, it's, it's as if he's saying the Lord loves you because he loves you. I mean, he, 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 he has chosen you and he set his love on you just because, you know, and, and really with the sense that you get from that passage, again, uh, you know, notice that he's saying it's not because of this factor here. Um, and you could, and a, a whole bunch of other things could have been added to that list of not becauses. Um, it's not because of this, or it's not because of that, um, that God is, has, has set his love on you. Um, and again, that, that speaks to the whole uh, agape mindset uh, that, uh, that I was mentioning before. So it's not um, based on any sort of outward feature um, of us or, or people um, uh, that God uh, sets his love on us, um, but it's because that he just simply loves um, and so, so it's not based on any sort of a, attraction or anything attractive in us. In fact, if there's anything that we had to offer to God, it would be a whole bunch of demerits and a, a bunch of uh, things uh, that are related to things that make us totally unlovable. I mean, if we're, if we're totally honest about um, who, uh, who we were before Christ and even some of our tendencies even after Christ, you know, even with our thoughts and, and deeds and things like that, we do unlovable things um, a lot of the time. And you know, if you were to if you were to just if you were to just to take into consideration, just from a, in, a, in a general sense, um, what uh, what Romans one says. If we're familiar with with the whole thing of Romans one, I don't have to read the whole thing. Um, you know, uh, I, even though I could, it's you know, you read the second part of Romans 1, and it's, and it's pretty depressing. But even in the last part there, the last kind of chunk of verses there in Romans chapter 1 kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of just the unattractiveness of man altogether um, in verse uh, 28 and following where it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers. Notice this, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give a, approval to those who practice them. So you get that. And, and again, like I said, that's just the last chunk of, of, of verses there of that section. If I started in verse 18, we would get even a, a fuller picture of what we're dealing with as it, as it relates to the, the sinfulness of, of man. And if we're talking about, you know, does God's, is God's love towards us because of, or, or, or even towards man because of anything um, inwardly or outwardly attractive about them, the answer to that question would be no. In fact, you know, this is, what's laid out here, I would say, is one of the big reasons why you have what follows um, in the book of Romans. It shows us why the gospel needs to be preached. But again, that just goes to show that God in sending his love on people, is, it says his love on people even when you have a situation like this. Now, I don't have to, and, or wouldn't have the time to go through a whole exposition of much of the book of Romans, if I did, maybe that, was, that would be where the hour and a half, two hours of the this, of this series finale would come from, but we won't do that. But if we were to fast forward to, uh, to chapter five, and you kind of get, you know, so, so just again, keeping in mind what we just read there, and specifically remember one of, the, one of those uh, things that, I, that was listed there in chapter one was people who are haters of God, right? So, um, but even in, in, uh, in chapter five, um, and let's start in, in verse six, and I think this is, a, this is a passage that a lot of people are familiar with, um, but it says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in our, in our most wretched state, you know, in, 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 in the midst of our sinfulness, it says there that uh, God shows his love. How, how, did God, how did God show his love? Well, ultimately, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but ultimately it, it, you know, it appeared uh, 
with Christ on the cross, right? And even if you go a little bit further, and I think it's in uh, verse 11, I think, um, um, or maybe not, I think it's in verse, uh, actually verse 10, um, it talks about how we, uh, how we were reconciled to God while we were enemies of him, okay? So before coming to Christ, understand what our, what our true relationship with God is or was before, before we came to Christ. We were enemies of God. And still being, and even though we were enemies, God took the initiative to bring us to himself, to, to reconcile us uh, to himself, to be in right relationship. And so really, if you think about it, if we were enemies before we came to Christ, if, if that was our status, and then we even see what we saw before in, in verse 8, you know, it says that God showed us his love uh, for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You realize that God and Christ is the ultimate example of what it, what it looks like to love your enemies. You know, the whole thing of, of what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, love your enemies. Well, God did that and he did, and he, and he did that for us. He showed, he showed us what that, what that is. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, that's truly amazing. Um, so it's not... Um, you know, again, like I said, this, the love of God isn't based on anything um, attractive about us, and it's not based on um, anything that we initiate first. You know, I think we might be familiar with the, first, uh, with the verse in 1 John 4, I believe it's verse 19, it says, uh, we love because he first loved us. It wasn't the other way around. In fact, we didn't, we didn't have that sort of capacity in our unregenerate state. Remember, Romans 1, haters of God, right? Um, and so God was the one who took the initiative. It wasn't, we love God and therefore he loved us back. That's not the way it worked. Um, so it, it wasn't based on any sort of first move or initiation um, on our part. So even with what we've said there just a little bit, I mean, uh, hopefully you're, you're, you're seeing um, just how, you know, when we say ama the amazing love of God, really just um, how amazing that truly is. Um, and uh, in, in talking about this further, as far as the love of God, um, you know, we can ask the question, what, what is, how extensive um, is God's love? Does God's love cover everybody? Does it cover just a certain portion of people and whatnot? And um, I think we're aware, we're aware that God loves us, right? You know, um, as his children, we are, we are loved by God. Um, does he love the unbeliever? Um, yes, absolutely he does. Now, what, we would, what I would say about that, though, is that the love that God has for the unbeliever is different than the love that he has for his children. And that shouldn't be surprising. Um, even within our human relationships, it, that's, how it, uh, that's how things kind of work. But, um, you know, the whole thing about God's love for even the unbeliever, the one thing that, uh, that comes to mind, and I'll just uh, show this to you real quick, is Mark chapter 10 um, with, the, uh, um, with the rich young ruler. Um, and I think we're familiar, I'm going to guess anyway, and we're familiar with this account of the, of the rich young ruler where um, this man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And so in Jesus' answer, he pretty much gives them the law. You know, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't defraud, you know, all those sorts of things. In order to, um, in order to demonstrate to the rich young ruler that he doesn't measure up. That's, that's really what you do when, when someone like Jesus, or even today when we interact with people, if we were to give people the law, um, the purpose of that is, to borrow Paul's words from Romans 7, is, is so that sin will look utterly sinful. Because the idea is to look at the as the at the holy and righteous standard of God, and uh, uh, just given by the law, and just coming to a realization, I don't measure up. But that's not what this guy's response was. It's like I've kept all of these since I was since I was a little kid, since I was since I was yay high. So um, so he thinks that he's in he's in good shape. But um, right after he says that, he says that in verse twenty, he said to him, "Teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth." And then in verse 21, it says, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And if you know, the, you know what happens next, he, he's very sad because he had great wealth. And so Jesus, really what Jesus did was he exposed that man's 
idolatry, idolatry for himself. So he, he already had a God. He already had a master and he wasn't willing to give that up. But you notice there in verse 21, it talks about how, you know, even in that, in that instance, we know a guy, he doesn't, he doesn't have a true understanding of, of, of salvation or anything like that, even in this interaction that he has with, with Jesus. And Jesus looking at him and loving him. Um, and then, and, and, catch, and catch this, you know, it says that, he, that, that, uh, that Jesus loved him, but then he told him to do what Jesus probably knew would be impossible for him. So notice what his love for him didn't mean. It didn't mean saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll have so, a little bit of li a wiggle room to welcome you into the community so that, you know, it, it would totally go against uh, that pastor in Texas that I mentioned at the beginning of the, of, of the message. You know, kind of get, painting a picture of this God and of this Jesus that says, you know, we're very permissive and, and welcoming of everybody. Come on in, even if uh, you still uh, hang on to your rebellion and your idolatry and all sorts of things. That's not what Jesus did here. So in a way, maybe you could say that God demonstrates his love for this unbeliever by telling him the hard truth. Okay. Um, but even so, with this interaction, and it's just interesting. This is in, this is the only account in the other parallel accounts. It doesn't it doesn't mention that phrase, but here in Mark it does, where it says Jesus looking at him, loved him. Okay, and so even though you had a guy who didn't have his theological head on straight, uh, Jesus loved him in a, I guess you could say in a compassionate and maybe in a pitying sort of way. I guess you I guess you could say. Um, uh, that he loved him. Now, again, like, I want to reiterate here and th that when we're talking about God's love for the unbeliever, it's not, um, it's not along the same lines or on the same level um, that you have um, for, uh, for his own children. Um, in fact, if you read scripture, you know that, um, that God's love and care and compassion and um, all those things are, are Will, are, are intact and will always be intact for us all the way in eternity. That's not going to be the case for unbelievers, especially when it comes to uh, judgment and final wrath um, and, and whatnot. But, um, but, but let's consider a little bit the whole thing about God's love for us for, and God's love for his people. But before we do that, I want to point something else out about the love of God just real briefly, um, you know, before... Bringing, talking about God's love for us into the equation. And that has to do with God's love um, that has existed in eternity past among, among the Godhead. You know, one of the things we have to realize about the love of God is that, I mean, God's love, just like all his other attributes, are, are natural to himself. And they aren't things that, that, uh, that grew or developed um, or, or anything like that. It, I mean, God has always been love even from eternity past. So you, you might think, okay, God is love, and God has always been a loving God all the way in eternity past. What was he loving? Well, he was loving and still loves, I would say, himself, okay? And even if you talk about specific members in the Godhead, particularly, um, particularly between the Father, God the Father, and God the Son, uh, you, see so, you see some amazing things. Now, I don't think we're strangers to this. You look at places like uh, in, in Matthew um, and some of the other uh, uh, accounts where um, at, in uh, John the Baptist where people hear the voice of God and saying, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. And you hear, you hear him saying the same thing, for example, in Matthew 17 in the, at the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? And the voice of God uh, being heard by, by Peter, James, and John. Um, when they were up on the mountain and they saw Moses and Elijah, he, and, and God says about Christ, this is, my, this is my beloved son, or this is the son whom I love. With him I am well pleased, okay? And so you get a sense of this, you know, this love relationship between father and son. I mean, really, in, in reality, it's, it's, within, it's among all the members of the Trinity, so the Spirit is in that as well. But, I mean, we, you have ex, explicit... Uh, uh, mentionings of that in scripture, uh, particularly as it relates to the uh, love between um, the Father and the Son. And we know that that's a, you know, if we're talking about God in all his perfection, we know that that's a perfect, uh, a perfect love and a love that I would say probably even that um, 
exceeds all of our, our, our understandings of just the, the magnitude of the love that, that, that the Father and the Son had for one another. Um, but if you, to get a sense of this, uh, the eternality of that, of that love, I just would just point your mind uh, to John chapter 17. Um, and in John chapter 17, um, verse 24, and this is, uh, this is uh, in Jesus' high priestly prayer um, bef- uh, on, the night, uh, on the night of his arrest and, and before his arrest. Um, and this is, what he, this is what he says in verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am so, that my glo- so to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So that's so the 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 love between the father and the son has been has been something that goes on before the foundation of the world before creation and all those sorts of things. Now keep that in mind because I'm going to bring that verse up again uh you know as it relates to something having to do with us. But um so this was a, a love before the before the uh the world began before the foundations of the world. Now here's the thing. Let's so we we know that there's a there's a there's a, a great intense love relationship between between the father and the son um, that's truly amazing. It goes again again it goes to eternity past. Let me call your attention to the previous verse. I mean, usually we go usually we go and uh, uh, go forward, but I'm going to take you backwards from verse 24 to verse 23 to point out something interesting here um, in John 17, where it says. Um, um, I, well, let me start in verse 22 because verse 23 looks like I think uh, is in mid-sentence here. Um, so in verse 22, it says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And even that in itself is totally amazing. But verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So think about what we have there. If we put verses 23 and 24 together, what we see there is a love that the same love that the father has for the son is the same love that he has for us as well. And that's totally amazing. Okay, if we understand the uh, the immense love relationship between father and son. And then as we see there in verse 23, that the same love that the father has for the son is the same love that he has for us then you can truly come to know and understand you know, just how great that love is. And hopefully that should give you some sort of confidence, uh, even as it relates to how we live in the here and now and knowing that we're not always at our best. Um, just as the love of God is something where, that we love to hear about, um, I think it's also just as true where you know, we can have certain doubts in our minds just based on you know, if you had a bad day and, you know, whether in your heart, your head, your speech and just your other conduct and stuff, you're like, man, it's just, just it's just not my day. And you kind of, and, you know, you kind of start having these thoughts creep in your mind as like, how in the world is it even possible that God loves me right now? But if you're reminded from the from the wonderful testimony of Scripture, John 17, 23, that God's love for the son um, is the same as his love for you, that should, that should change that thought in that moment uh, pretty quickly. Um, and we know that God's love for, God the Father's love for the Son isn't anything that's going to be abandoned or it's going uh, to end or anything like that. And so the same thing for us as well um, as it relates to the God, um, God the Father's love for us. Now, as we consider a little bit more the, you know, the whole thing about God's love for us. Let me just point out a few, um, a few things here, um, uh, just a, a few points that we can make regarding that. A uh, few other points. I mentioned to you before, as it, as it relates to God's love uh, within the within the Godhead, and specifically in in verse twenty four, how there is that love that uh, that God uh, that the Father had for the Son before before the foundation of the world. Well, as it relates to God's love for us, we, can, we, can, we know that God's love for us was eternal as well, even before the foundation of the world. You're saying, how is that, how is that a thing? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, and this is probably, I don't know, 
I don't know the number of how many times I've referred to Ephesians 1 throughout the course of this, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this series, it seems like it's been quite a bit, but here again, we're gonna make another, <laughs> Connie's nodding yes, yeah. you know, but there's, there's so many good things in there uh, in that chapter related to certain attributes of God. And, um, and even here, as we, as we look at a certain aspect of, of, of God's love for us and for his children, let me start in, in verse three to show you what, what, we, can, what we can learn here, uh, where it says, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Keep that in mind. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Okay. In love, he predestined us. So he predestined before the foundation of the world. He predestined, he chose before the foundation of the world, and he did it in love. Which means that, and let's, let's keep this real here when we're considering this, is that this is something that was, that was specific in God's mind. What I mean by that is that and this wasn't some sort of nebulous sort of general sort of thing. It's like, I'm going to, you know, choose certain people, you know, we'll see how things go, that sort of thing. When he, when he chose us, he chose us specifically in love before the, before the foundation of the world. In love, he did this. So reading that here, what do you see? We see that he loved us even before we were, even before we were created because he had us in mind. Now, that's, that's different from, from what we're, you know, what we're used to in the human realm. Um, you know, maybe... Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can think of my parents who told me stories about, you know, things in their past and they, you know, they, you know to give them an idea of how long ago it was. It's like, oh, this was, this was before you were even a thought, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we weren't planning, to, we weren't planning you yet. This was, so this was a long time ago and your father and I, you know, blah, 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 blah. You, you weren't even, you weren't even on our minds at that point yet, you know, and that sort of thing. But just think that that's not, that's not, the way it is with God, you know, just as it relates to before our very existence. With God, it wasn't a matter of, you know, well, before, you know, I wasn't, you weren't even a thought yet uh, or in my mind or everything. No, he very much was a thought. And even before our existence, in love, he predestined us to, to what does it say there? To adoption. Now, Here's another area where if we wanted to do a true series finale fashion of an hour and a half to two hours, go off on, on the whole thing of adoption and how truly wonderful that is, but we won't do that, okay? But it is noteworthy there, as long as we're talking about love and everything, um, we're, we're adopted to himself as sons um, through Jesus Christ. And again, just as I mentioned a little bit earlier before, the whole thing of, of relationship between father and son, you know, here we see that, you know, being adopted as sons is, I mean, just think about this, sons, daughters, whatever you want to use, children, we are children of God. So if we're, if we think about this uh, in the regular human sort of, sort of realm, um, and assuming that you're dealing with a somewhat healthy, though an imperfect, you know, relationship between father and son in a, in a good environment, when you know, we, our thoughts can exceed that even more when we consider that God as our father is one who really loves us as his children. And that's truly an amazing thing. John was one who, who understood that because in 1 John 3, 1, what does he say? He says, how great a love, how great a love that the father has lavished on us, right? Mm -hmm. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. Um, is, what, is what he says in, in that verse. So, um, and I will, I will say this. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll just add this one thing as far as adoption is concerned, because I think that this is, I mean, in the, in, the, in the Greek and the Roman world, when it came to adoption, um, with adoption, uh, one thing that was, that was true is that um, the adopted child cannot be disinherited, um, which is, I mean, which is, which is truly an amazing thing. And so um, if there's anything uh, that, that says um, about his love and even his, his 
uh, the eternality of his love and the security that we have in him, that should tell us a lot um, if we're making the comparisons. Because, I mean, you read about adoption there, then, and Paul's original audience would have been able to you know, connect the language and what he's talking about there. So even with adoption, we're talking about something that's pretty amazing, being adopted as, as sons and daughters, as children of God, okay? So God's love was, was set and established for us before the foundation of the world, right? His love is all, for us was also sacrificial, and I think that that's, that's something that, is, uh, that brings to mind uh, familiar uh, um, verses like John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have uh, eternal life. Um, you also think about Ephesians 5 um, and in verse 25, and this is when the, the whole area of talking about husbands and wives and that sort of thing, but in, the, in, in what he's laying out there, he makes a comparison to how, we should, uh, how husbands should be to wives um, just as Christ is to the church. Um, and it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay. And this is, and, you know, when you, when you understand that the, that the giving up of the son, I mean, what that, what that entails is his precious blood. You begin to see and you begin to understand just how big of a, uh, how big of a deal that this is, uh, just as it relates to the to the, to the great sacrifice, the sacrificial love that, that, uh, that God demonstrated for us. And so really, think about this. If you, want, if you want to understand or try to understand the greatness of God's love, all you really need to do is look at the cross, right? All you really need to do is look at the cross. God, God's, God's love is, uh, I mean, you can, you can see a couple of things in, uh, in the cross of Christ. And I think I may have mentioned this when we were talking about the wrath of God, but if I didn't, here we go, is that it, with the cross of Christ, it does demonstrate God's hatred for sin, right? I mean, that, I think that that's something that's pretty evident. And it also demonstrates to a very high degree um, the love that he has for his people. Um, and so, and, and just really the, what he accomplishes through that in saving us. Um, one of the things that's important for us to understand is that when he saved us, it was, it was more than just a, a, a get, out, get out of jail free sort of, sort of thing that was extended to us, um, where we escape his judgment and wrath. That is part of it. But if you look at places like First, uh, First Peter 3.18, um, it says that Christ died, Christ died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God, okay? That's where you get into the whole thing of reconciliation, the two warring parties coming together in peace, in relationship. So escape from judgment, yes, but keep in mind there that God's purpose, another one of God's purposes in all of that was to bring us to himself. And, you know, again... You, you, you have the whole thing of John 3, 16, God so loved the world, this is what he did. And, and so in doing that, in sacrificing himself for us in love, and even, again, as I said, in love predestining us before the foundation of the world, he brings us to God, right? So we want to talk about the, the greatness of God's love. I mean, the cross really demonstrates that to a, to a very high degree, okay? And so you have the, you have the, you know, the, the eternal, uh, the love of God in eternity past, you have the sacrificial aspect of God's love. Um, and one other thing just to mention as it relates to that, and I think that this is very important, I think I kind of hinted at this a little bit earlier, um, is the unbreakable nature of, of God's love, okay? And again, if we establish our, if we establish our thoughts on the, on the whole idea I mean, you can establish your minds on so many other different things related to God's love. But again, just remember, if you, if you establish your, your thoughts and your minds on the fact that the, the love that the Father has for the Son is the same as the, as the love that He has for us, you know, you come to understand, again, is, is the love between, father, uh, with, between the Father and the Son anything that's going to dissolve or break or anything? No, absolutely not. And uh, in Romans chapter 8, you get a good sense of the unbreakable nature of, of God's love. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite chapters within one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, 
this is also worthy of a series finale extension of an hour, an hour and a half sort of thing if we just did an exposition of, of Romans chapter 8. But for now, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just point you to a, a, a few verses here, um, really starting in verse, in verse 35, um, where it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? And if you want to take things a step further here and just really understand and realize the unbreakable uh, nature of God's love and how it's going to how it's going to be something that carries on even into eternity. Uh, we don't have to turn there, but rest assured, we'll, you know, we'll talk about, well, Mark will, will bring this up. I'm sure it'll be a while since it's in Revelation 21, but, um, you know, you're, when, we, when we talk about uh, uh, John being shown the bride of Christ, and then, uh, you know, we, we have the picture in, in, in Revelation 21 of the bride of Christ in the form of the new Jerusalem. If you, if you do a comparison of that in, in chapter 21 and just kind of the language that's used in verse 17 in an opposite way, when it's talking about the new Jerusalem coming down, John, uh, the, the text is identifying that as a representative picture of the people of God. But what do you read in, in Revelation 21? Go ahead and read it for yourself on your own time, particularly those, those first initial verses, probably the first eight-ish verses or so. It's, 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 it's wedding language. You know, it's, you know, the whole thing of the bride of Christ, I'll show you the bride and that sort of thing, and how, you know, God's, God's presence with us is going to be forever. He will, we will be his people, and he will be our God, and, and all those sorts of things. It's a beautiful thing of, of bride and bridegroom, the, 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 the illustrative picture of bride and bridegroom that's, that's laid out there um, in that text. And that's when sin has fully and finally been judged, and we're brought into the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and we, we see that the, that the complete bride, uh, his complete chosen people, um, are, are brought together um, to, be with the, to, to be with the bridegroom forever. Forever, okay? And so that's, some, that's, a, that's a truth and that's a reality that doesn't, that, that doesn't break in, in time. Um, you know, it, even as it says, even as it says there, um, neither death nor life or angels or things present nor things to come nor powers, any of those things aren't able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, okay? And so, um, so his love is eternal, it's, in, it's infinite, it's sacrificial, and truly, truly an amazing reality, you know, even though, you know, um, I, I feel like there's, there's grander words to use than amazing, but I mean, even so, I think you get, you get the idea. Um, so let, that, let those truths settle in your hearts and your minds. Meditate on those things. Meditate on a lot of other things that we've been talking about as it relates to the attributes of God. Um, and, uh, you know, as you, as you study Scripture, as you read Scripture, um, you know, there, I'm sure that there are a lot of things that, that the Holy Spirit will bring to mind just as you read Scripture that, that informs you more and more about who he is, not just in his love, but in all sorts of other things uh, regarding his character and his attributes. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and thank you for um, just what, all the things that we've been shown in this series as a whole. And I pray that all of those things, that we would take those things to heart, that it would be planted deep and that it would work towards our transformation. Lord, we thank you for your amazing love, even though there isn't anything um, that I have done or can do to, uh, to earn that love, but um, because of your sovereign purpose and because of the fact that you just love, you've set your love on me, you've set your love on all the people here in this room. And what a great and marvelous love that it is. And uh, we just thank you so much for who you are and what you've done in our lives and what you continue to do. And we give you all the praise and honor and glory to you because you are very worthy of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.